Okay. So here's another post-operative abdomen. So a few hours of abdominal pain and vomiting on the uh, left side. And so you see obstructed bowel and intra-loop free fluid. This is called the Tanga sign. We'll talk a little bit about that as well. So can you guys appreciate, I don't know if I can get a marker here, but you can sort of see you've got the bowel there and you've got contents moving and then you've got a lumen present and then you also have, can't do that for the screencast. Then you also have um, fluid on the other side of the lumen. So extra luminal fluid is sort of a later sign of uh, bowel obstruction. And then on the right side, we've got collapsed small bowel. So this is the finding of what we call a transition point. So we have our obstruction and then we have our loose bowel afterwards is called the transition point. It's something that comprehensive radiology looks for pretty routinely when they're assessing for small bowel obstruction, but it's not something that you need to find in order to make the diagnosis, but it really does help you if you see it. So it's one of those things where I'm sort of torn often when I'm assessing a patient with small bowel obstruction. If I put the probe on and I see evidence of small bowel obstruction, that sets my clinical course. I'm not going to take time to look for a transition point being present there. Uh, this patient got admitted and did need surgery for some adhesion assessment. But it's really good to compare sort of the before the obstruction where you see this increased dilation of the bowel and then after the area of obstruction where you see this kind of maze-like collapse small bowel layers and that's really more in keeping with an empty and sort of more standard small bowel. And what's, what's the tanga sign? Oh. The tanga sign is the evidence of the uh, extra luminal free fluid on the... Yeah. And just the plique that tells you it's not large bowel? Right. Yeah. So the plique are going to tell you it's not large bowel and we'll talk a bit about finding those. We've got a couple pictures of plique coming up as well. But you do want to look for, for that in terms of your, your determination because obviously small bowel, if you're going to be measuring things, is much larger than, or large bowel is much larger than small bowel, pardon me. So what are some limitations of ultrasound for small bowel obstruction? Well, it's very hard to identify partial small bowel obstruction because really we're looking for those signs of complete, um, complete closure. The transition point can be difficult to identify. And the specific cause can be difficult to identify. So this is really saying we've got an obstructed bowel, but it's not saying. So it's important to recognize those limitations, especially when we're involving other specialties, thinking about consulting surgery. Okay, so this gut, we'll just play the video, apologize. I think is a really nice example of that kind of poo and fro motion, a sort of partial peristalsis where the gut's trying to peristalse against something that's preventing the ability of the contents to move forward. So can you see how the, it, instead of it being fluid filled, it's filled with bowel contents, but can you appreciate that kind of movement of the sparkles through that back and forth a little bit? So this was a patient that actually had a mechanical obstruction from a hair bezoar. And so you're seeing that mechanical obstruction in the lumen of the small bowel, but you're not actually visualizing the hair bezoar here, right? We're looking at those signs kind of as the after effect. So this is what I mean. Could this have been an obstruction externally from an adhesion? Sure. And we're not really identifying something that's, that's standing out in that way. So you want to think about infarction and ischemia, and this, this goes back to our conversation about neck. Uh, when we see fluid-filled distended bowel loops with extraluminal free fluid, it's called the Tanga sign. You'll see that a lot in the resources that I'll, I'll talk about at the end. Absent peristalsis is a late sign as well. And then bowel wall thickening greater than three millimeters. So when we think about that physiology of that distension of the wall, the wall is getting increased pressure. So it's getting worsening blood flow. It's starting to swell. It's unable to peristalse. Those are all at the end of the spectrum where we start to get more worried than just seeing larger lumen, fluid filled, some peristalsis. Does that kind of make sense? If we think about it in, in more, of a, more of a spectrum type of way. So in this view, we see these large loops of something, right? We don't know what this is at this stage. We've just put, we've got a distended abdomen and we've put our probe on. You can see that there's lumens and they're filled with some form of material because it almost looks like it's snowing in there. Can you guys appreciate that kind of snow globe appearance to it? So could this be a cyst? Could it be large bowel? 
where is it and what are we looking for? And this is when it goes back to looking at the plica, like you correctly pointed out, or Valvula Conevente, same name, or different name, same thing. So if we continue on our journey, we can take a look here and we start to see the plica coming out. So there you can see a plica in the same patient as we move along the vowel. And we've still got that snow globe appearance, but we've really got that more characteristic distended small bowel appearance. So as we move, we keep doing the same thing. And here you've got a nice shot of small bowel with that true anatomic plica sitting there. So thinking about that anatomy to differentiate it from the large bowel, but also from other fluid filled structures that could be in the abdomen. And we see a lot of mucus mucocysts and other types of abdominal swellings that can have a very similar turbulent appearance, right? But you have to have the symptomatology, you have to have kind of the history of it, and then also think about what you're seeing on the screen and really try and orient yourself with your anatomy at the end of the day. And what's the measurement for large bowel? So the benefits for this are that it can decrease your cognitive load in previously undifferentiated patients. You can put in your early your nasogastric tube early and you can inform your consultants appropriately. So it really helps in that undifferentiated patient to sort of clear that load for you and make a decision about where you're going to go next. We'll talk a little bit about fecal retention because um, it was included in the slides that Mark wanted me to cover. And so fecal retention, you can find on ultrasound, although it's not something that I do routinely for patients with constipation. And really what you're looking for is rectal diameter. So in your traditional fast scan, you'll see the bladder at the top of the screen, and you're just looking inferiorly to that uh, and measuring the rectal diameter. As you scan through, you might be able to see that it looks quite distended in this patient. And that's where the measurement can happen. Now, remembering that there's also, you know, reproductive organs in our female population there, again, important to practice your pelvic views and recognize all of your different anatomy so that you're able to measure the right thing. You don't want to be measuring the spine, which is something that you can often measure uh, when we're thinking about cutting our patient in the transverse way and looking at the bladder and the rectum behind it, the spine is behind that. And often we see inaccurate measurement when people are measuring the spine. So really trying to identify that bony landmark if you're gonna go through and measure for fecal retention. But again, this is one of those things where, you know, constipation is really a clinical diagnosis, much like I don't ultrasound or x-ray for it. I tend not to ultrasound for it uh, because at the end of the day, if I don't find a large descended bowel with fecal retention, I probably still am gonna go on with the treatment. So thinking about choosing that judiciously, but important to know that it can be seen. So where am I putting my caliper? So I would put your caliper, and I apologize to those who are screencasting. Um, I would put it. So that's your bladder, and those are your psoas muscles. This is your rectum, so I would measure it across there. So yeah, so if you go back there measurement yeah so hopefully this quick run through helps you understand the indications for ultrasound for bowel obstruction review sonographic findings in bowel obstruction and in retention two resources that i took from and i would point you to uh, western sono out of london ontario has a really great video on how to ultrasound for small bowel obstruction with a lot of the findings and the image of the lawn mowering was from ultrasound of the week. Uh, they do have a question on small bowel obstruction. These are both in adult populations, but the same principles apply to our pediatric population, uh, thinking about all those different signs and symptoms of small bowel obstruction.